Where right, Anushka, you can start now. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, I warmly welcome you to the second special lecture for our 15th flagship All India Conference of China Studies. The conference is being organized by ICS in partnership with the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, the Guwahati University, the Omeo Kumar Institute of Social Change and Development, and the India Office of the Kondra Rajanoir Stiftum. I, Anushka Saxena, am working with ICS as a research intern, and I shall be the MC for the session today. The theme of our conference this year is Connected Geographies and Cultural Interfaces. This particular session will feature a special lecture on the theme, Mobile Attraction, Traveling Film Projectionists, and Rural Cinema Exhibition in Mao's China. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce our eminent panelists. Allow me to welcome our chair for the lecture, Professor Rashmi Dorai Swami, who is a professor at the MMAJ Academy of International Studies, Jamia Milia Islamia, New Delhi, and a recipient of the National Best Film Critic Award in 1994. Please also allow me to introduce our keynote speaker for the lecture, Professor Lu Xianning, reader in modern Chinese culture and language, SOAS China Institute, SOAS University of London. As I mentioned, the topic she'll be presenting on today is mobile attraction, traveling film projectionists and rural cinema exhibition in Mao's China. With this, I hand over the floor to the chair, Professor Dorai Swami, to take the proceedings forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anushka. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to chair this, uh, what promises to be a very wonderful lecture. Um, I, I will just make a few opening points. Uh, one, the, as cinema began at the end of the 19th century, uh, it manifested its possibilities for showing life in a realistic manner, as well as fantasy. The, the realism of cinema, the moving images also could show fantasy. And these were manifested in the films of the pioneers, uh, Lumine, Lumiere brothers, who uh, showed us the arrival of a train or um, workers leaving a factory and George Melier, who you know, showed the journey to the moon. So just as this di dual mode of representation uh, manifested itself well in the very beginnings of the cinema, uh, the various formats through which films could be viewed, that too manifested pretty early on in the history of cinema. The first, of course, was uh, the one that we are all very familiar with, which is watching films in enclosed spaces, in built spaces, uh, in the dark as part of an anonymous crowd and so on. The second one is what was called the cinema of attraction where uh, the film was viewed in the context of the fairground. So there were spectacular performances and cinema was one of the variety items on view. The third is probably what uh, Professor Lu will be speaking about today is where projectionists, very dedicated, committed people, uh, carried a whole lot of equipment around, uh, not just around in cities, but to rural areas, remote corners of the regions and uh, cities that they lived in, where uh, they would be showing these films either in the open air or in make, make two tents and so on. And in fact, it is the second, it's all these three formats that made uh, cinema the popular art form that it became through the 20th century, because it was literally taken to every nook and cranny of um, the countries it was being exhibited in. Now, Asia has a very, very uh, rich tradition of uh, many kinds of cinema, and China is one of the leading uh, film countries in the world, and it has a very long history, uh, very many interesting periodizations of history, and Professor Lu today will be speaking about one of those, which is uh, the Mao period, and speaking about uh, mobile uh, projections. The thing about mobile projections also is that it is extremely improvisatory because uh, it, it's not, it doesn't follow fixed schedules, fixed timings that the theater projections follow, but these are more open ended. So uh, there's a lot of improvisation going on uh, from all uh, 
ends at, as it were. And it's also very intersectional because there's the rural, there's the city, there's the global, there's the national. And I think the period that uh, Professor Lu will be touching upon uh, today will uh, be, you know, it's modern, it's also traditional, like in the fairground with a lot of traditional performances and so on. So um, uh, I think uh, these, there's just these few uh, points to be made about how um, mobile projections really is a very, very important aspect of uh, viewing cinema. Uh, I will now hand over uh, the floor to Professor Lu uh, to deliver her lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Daraswamy, for your kind introduction and insightful opening remarks. So I'm now going to share my screen. So it's my pleasure to share my research with you. Uh, so I have been specializing on, uh, specializing on cinema during the Mao period time. As you all know, Mao's China roughly covers, from the, uh, covers the period from the year 1949 to 1976. So this period saw many political campaigns and um, uh, it also saw the popularization of a socialist culture. So let me start with a quote, a very famous statement by uh, Lenin, that of all arts, the most important for us is the cinema. When people think about the Chinese socialist cinema, inevitably many people think about propaganda, and many people tend to look at the film text uh, the stories, the narratives, and I try to figure out how those narratives impart ideological messages. Um, so there, of course, those studies are important. Uh, it draws our attention to how film narratives shape the ideal citizens or socialist subjectivity. But I question this uh, overemphasis on the textual study because the prerequisite for cinema to achieve its political function is that cin cinema has to encounter its audience. Therefore, I suggest to go beyond the filmic text or the on-screen world. We need to look at what is happening on, uh, off screen. We need to really take cinema as a whole institution, which includes production, distribution, and exhibitions. So in today's lecture, I'd like to focus on traveling film projectionist. It is also called mobile film projectionist, uh, which is more uh, direct translation of the Chinese term liu dong dianying fang ying yuan. For me, those mobile film projectionists function as the agent of Chinese socialist spectacle. They bring films they, uh, to the broadest audience. They made films more accessible accessible, especially to illiterate audiences in remote rural areas. On the other hand, they themselves became an attraction, a spectacle, because of their excellence, um, appealing uh, performance and, um, during the exhibition. Finally, I'd also like to think, uh, to contemplate, contemplate on how rural cinema exhibition provides a training ground to, for technical, technologically savvy and a politically responsible socialist citizen. In other words, cinema exhibition is a site for forming or remoting socialist person. So let me start to give you some background of uh, the uh, the, the socialist film distribution and the exhibition network. So let's first look at the literacy. According to Seberg's study, in three decades, from 1949 to 1979, roughly uh, the either, either school age or adult literacy roughly stayed the same, about 32%, which is very low. So you can imagine most of the Chinese population populace at the time was illiterate. 
16 left, left, leftist film professionals uh, just right before the founding of the PRC, uh, including Ouyang Yuqian, Xia Yan, uh, many leading uh, film professionals at the time. They offered suggestions to the newly, uh, to the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party. For example, they specified uh, for the new nation, for the new socialist state, we should build more state-run movie theaters, first at the provincial capitals, and then in cities and towns, and set a wide network of mobile projection teams so that the films can be screened in the countryside, factories, and the mines, and the military bases. So here is a chart about the number of movie theaters and the projection teams. Movie theaters serve urban population. So you will see uh, the movie theater is indicated by the yellow line, but we see a sharp increase in the number of projection teams from 522 in the year 1950 to over uh, roughly 14,000 uh, in 1965. Projection teams played an important role in disseminating cinema, in disseminating films, and conveying political messages to Chinese populace, Chinese population. Uh, to cultivate a, cap a capable team of projectionists, the Chinese Communist Party set up a number of training programs. For instance, as early as 1950, a special training program for the operator of the 16 millimeter movie projectors was set in uh, in Nanjing. Uh, over one, it's a, like 1,886 projectionists from over 32 provinces received the training. So here is a manual. But you will also see uh, there are were many innovations in uh, producing portable lightweight projectors, which enable the projectionist to bring uh, the films to the remote areas. So uh, this is a picture which I, I took in Shanghai Film Museum. This is a 35 millimeter mobile projectors, commonly known as the leather bag type projector, pi bao ji. They're so lightweighted and small, so it was very uh, practical. And here is another innovation. It's a 8.75 millimeter film, film projector made in the 1970, uh, because this is much smaller, so it, it, uh, it, was, it would have been easier, even easier for projectors to bring them. Of course, um, mobile projection, uh, mobile film projection, was not excluded, it was not exclusive to China. In the socialist world, in the socialist states, we saw many such practices. For instance, um, in Soviet Union, we had the so-called Soviet edged trend. So these trends brought uh, theater performance, film screenings to uh, wide audiences as well. I would say what character what characterized Chinese mobile projection is its meager equipment and manpower, its heavy reliance on meager equipment and manpower. So for instance, here is an article published in Da Zhong Dianying, a very popular film magazine, Mass Cinema in 1952. From this article, we can tell um, the people at the time call use the term, it's, it's basically a peasant parlance. They use the term movie tractor, sometimes they use the term movie carts to refer to uh, the cinema on the wheels of, so what is movie tractor? So movie tractor refers to rub, rubber tired wagon pulled by horses or mules carrying three to four projectionists and the standard portable packages, uh, which include projector, generator, and attachments. So here is a photo. Uh, here is a photo of a female projectionist. Uh, you will see it's a, a, a very rudimental card pulled by mule. And here you, uh, the picture also showed the female projectionist, the physical label putting up uh, a screen in the open air. Um, 
because despite or because of the, the meagerness of equipment and heavy reliance on manpower, mobile projection teams were able to penetrate the inex inaccessible zones of China. Uh, for, for instance, we already have many coverages in the early 1950s about how um, uh, ordinary people in the frontier regions receive those mobile projection teams. Uh, so here we have an article called Brother Nationalities Love People Cinema. So this article offers many colorful depiction of the local reception of the, uh, of the projection teams. So I just read, uh, quickly read one paragraph. So upon arriving at uh, uh, Gongguo Mamu tribe in Gancha district, we saw our Tibetan compatriots, men and women, old to young, all dressed in colorful ethnic clothing with adornments. Some rode galloping horses and others played Tibetan musical instruments. The locals staged a grand ceremony to welcome Chama Mao's film team, uh, film team, as if they were celebrating their annual festival. Some of them even competed to arrange our accommodation and to invite us to their tents for a good chat. This is in the north, uh, 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 northwest of the China, but uh, similarly to the north, to the southwest of China, around the border of around the China-Vietnam border, we will see peasants from surrounding villages had to take with them food for three to four days and to track for 80 to 90 miles in order to attend one film screening. Such depiction just to illustrate uh, the peasants' enthusiasm for film. And those projectionists also received a warm welcome among the locals. So what kind of films were shown to them? For instance, in the early 1950s, uh, films such as, this is a China-Soviet Union co-production. It is a color documentary, Liberated China. Here's another film, The Birth of New China, The Victory of Indo-Mongolian People, etc. So those films really telling about uh, the birth story, the, the story of like the birth of the new nation. By showing such films, um, the projectionist invite audience to take the position of a members of the new nation. But uh, of course, this is the idea. It's the intent of the political message. But many audiences, they did not even know how to watch film because they lack film literacy. So you can call them as naive audience. They enjoyed the revolutionary cinema as the wonder show. They don't necessarily, they didn't necessarily understand the narrative. Uh, for them, they were attracted by the moving images. For instance, they would ask, how come people on the screen are like real people? They can't even talk. Okay. So rural film exhibition, there, there were many problems and challenges uh, during the Mao era. So we will see uh, in 1953, the state ad administration of Texas Tech, uh, taxation issued some new demand or order. For instance, film exhibition at the schools, factories, and the reception events was exempted from the culture and entertainment tax. Rural film exhibition was exempted from the industrial tax. So this is nice. There was a tax break. Uh, this was introduced to encourage um, the so-called uh, making the film screening, uh, film exhibition an enterprise. In the following year, the State Council of the PRC announced decision on establishing film exhibition network and a film industry. So this document suggests film projection teams should gradually realize enterprise management and must achieve a decrease in state subsidies year on year. However, in border regions, ethnic minority regions, and the sparsely populated areas of poor transport provisions, this transition should be advanced steadily according to varying circumstances and avoiding undue haste. Driven by such policies, uh, new problems related to rural cinema exhibition emerged. 
projectionists wanted to run screening quickly to generate more revenue, more income. So sometimes they ignore the political messages of the film, or they themselves did not so called uh, did not possess the so called correct political consciousness. Some projectionists, some projection teams refused to screen documentaries because they were not popular among the audiences. And some even made serious mistakes in their propaganda work. For instance, here is a very famous uh, so, uh, Soviet film, the, the Cossacks from the Kuban. In Chinese, it is translated as Happy Life, Xing Fu de Sheng Huo. The projectionist simply explain, oh, this is about a happy life uh, of um, uh, uh, the Soviet people, but they, uh, the, the romance, the love story, right? But they ignore the message. This is about the, collect the happy life on the collective farm, et cetera. There were also uh, ins incidences of malpractices and accidents in film screening, in film projection, et cetera. So here is a poem composed by an ordinary audience member from Hebei province. So the title is, Please Consider Rural Audience Interest. So here in this section, it, is, it describes the accidents, mishaps of film exhibition. You see a screen of either static snow or nonstop drizzle, but without a single silhouette. From some, unknown uh, from some unknown reason, no sound was heard. See, finally came sound. All of a sudden, the reel was broken off. Beads of sweat formed on the enthusiast uh, projectionist forehead. Of course, the state took some measures to encourage good practices and uh, especially to publicize the so-called exemplar or model film projectionist. Um, the state also issued uh, uh, such recommendations. For instance, we should pay special attention to attract educated youth from workers and the peasants' families to get involved in film projection and exhibitions. An ideal from projectionist should be the one who is not only technologically savvy and dutiful, but also equipped with good political consciousness. So from the early 1950s all the way to 1960s, you saw many uh, reports on the model projectionist. What is not notable, most notably, a lot of reports uh, are about the female, the female mobile team projections. Uh, here are some titles here. Uh, here are some titles of the articles published in Mass Cinema. So I'm going to give a brief example of the Three Sisters projection team, San Jie Mei, Fang Ying Dui. So the team was set up in the 1958. The three sisters, they are not biological sisters. They were uh, classmates in junior secondary schools. After graduation, they received the 45 days training program training for film projection, but they also engaged in political studies, uh, read Mao, uh, Mao Zedong's works, etc. For them, they are not just the colleagues, classmates, more importantly, they are class sisters. But the local people just call them elder sister, second sister, three sisters. So these three women said, oh, the name of our, of our projection team was given by the party and by the masses. Uh, of course, by engaging in film projection, these women combat, uh, also combated gender stereotypes. For instance, in the article, uh, which reports this projection team, it documents some rural gossips, the rural stereotype of women. For example, women are usually petty-minded and gossipy, and thus they can't work well together. So these three women, they were determined to dispel such myths. Uh, more importantly, they tried very hard, made no effort to improve their professional excellence. Um, they engaged in self-study, how to generate electricity, how to do film projection and propaganda work. 
uh, sometimes they use the broken film reel to practice threading films through the projectors and reduce the time of changing the reel from three minutes to 30 seconds. Uh, this team runs over 1,000 screenings without accidents for five consecutive years. Uh, they also made some innovation, technological innovation. For instance, they made a two lens and a three lens slide projectors, so which made uh, uh, the images which animated images. So those slide pro projectors, are, those, those, those slide projectors uh, in a way contributed to the making of the indigenous film, Tu uh, Dian Ying in Chinese, but it's basically the slideshow, but they can move, right? It's a, so it's an animated film. So um, let's look at how traveling film projectionist team actually work on the site. What do they have to do? What are the major exhibition practices? So their major task is to increase film attendance and to help audience understand the film. To achieve such purpose, such political goal, they did a lot of work pre-screening, during screening, and after or post-screening. So here is a propaganda, uh, it's, a, it's actually a woodcut, uh, which was published in the film magazine in preparation for tonight's film, uh, for tonight's film propagation. So here you see uh, the, the projectionist, they had a, a painting or posters more likely, and they are making the slideshow, the slides. So um, normally the, the good practice were also shared among the projectionist. So here are a number of tips. For instance, projectionists were encouraged to explain film plots with the aid of a supplementary materials such as posters and a palm-sized picture storybooks. They were also encouraged to make use of local blackboards, newspaper reading groups, and the cultural forms popular with peasants, such as the clapper talk. Clapper talk is a very popular performing art form in Northern China. Uh, it's a very like a uh, freestyle rhythmic talk to the accompaniment of a set of a bamboo uh, clappers. So the, uh, this type of traditional performing art was extremely popular among the local peasants. Um, so the projectionists, sometimes they held at symposiums at local schools to discuss films and to teach elements of cinema by demonstrating the workings of projectors. After screening, the same projection team would organize discussion sessions and invite the feedback, etc. During the screen, projectionists, um, most of them exhibited wonderful talents they were versatile performers. So here, I think this, uh, this poster tells us a lot. Here we see the, the lighting, but you also see the slides, and you also see the clappers, the bamboo clappers, right? And then the uh, iconic image of the mobile film projectionist is always a woman. So during the screening, these projectionists the peppered their pre-screening introduction with exciting uh, village news. Uh, this actually was just right before the, the screening of the, the main film. Sometimes they collect the news from the village and try to uh, include them in the slideshow. Uh, they also had to introduce positive and negative characters of the film and to, just to, uh, um, to prepare the audience for, for, for the viewing. And they provide explanations on the relationship among the characters and the highlight distinct features of the main characters. And sometimes between the intermission of changing the reel, they have to, uh, the good protectionist to provide a real change summary or intermission mini lectures. For the ethnic minority audiences, those projectionists also hone their skills in lip synchronization and a tonal infection inflection in order to dub Mandarin dialogues into ethnic languages in real time. So they were really not just a project, uh, technician projectionist, they were uh, film lecturers, they were also performers. Uh, they were also, uh, some of them were also excellent film programmers. 
because they have the intimate knowledge of the local audiences. They understand what kind of films were popular to which uh, section of audience, to the elderly audience, to the young audience. For example, uh, for the elderly audience, they love opera films. Here is a film called Liang Shan Bo and Zhu Ying Tai, which is uh, based on a famous Chinese legend. And sometimes they are very careful at um, putting together a double bill. Um, in what sense? For instance, uh, this film uh, is called Spring Days in Water Village. It is a very uh, boring film about uh, um, the rural subject matter, agricultural matter. And normally such films were not attractive to the rural audience. And so they combine such film with exciting, quick paced uh, combat or revolutionary war film. For instance, uh, Guerrillas on the Plane. So they put them together to do screening and uh, this way they still can attract a good number of audiences. So let me give you an example of the excellent performance of a projectionist, performer, propagandist. In 1964, All China Film, Exhibition, uh, All China Film Distribution and Exhibition Conference was held in Beijing. A young male projectionist named Zhang Zhichen, he demonstrated his live performance. Basically, he illustrated how he enlivened the film screening, how he helped the audience to understand the message. Um, I think he illustrated the, the best practice of a mobile film projectionist, uh, which requires projectionists to have a to train quick eyes, deft hands, and a fast mouth. So the film he used in that demonstration is called. Struggle in an Ancient City. This is a revolutionary war film uh, set in the Sino-Japanese War, the second Sino-Japanese War. So here is example. Uh, so I have uh, some screenshots. So this scene is set in Japanese military officer's office. Uh, we have our underground CCP member, um, and, um, Yang Xiaodong and his mother. So this is a this is a setup by the Japanese military officer. They captured the, uh, the CCP member. They also captured his mother and tried to convince the mother to uh, try to use the mother to convince him to, uh, uh, to change his mind. But let's take a look. In order to boister her son's revolutionary spirit, and the mother actually unexpectedly threw herself out of the window. Sorry, you will see. So the projectionist would interject his voice of a narration, his own narration. They abused their power and paradically moved over people, but like a rabbit tail, it won't last long. The dark clouds that cover the whole sky will disappear sooner or later, and there will be clear moonlight again. The audience um, was very impressed. Uh, because when the projectionist said the words cloud, uh, the clouds really appear on the screen. So here it's a projectionist that really elucid elucidates the political message. And here we have another scene, uh, uh, which is composed of a, a series of quick shots, quick superimposition. In this scene, the, undergrad, the, uh, the underground CCP member 
tries to convince the KMT, the, um, the KMT military officer to launch a military uprising very soon. So here is our protagonist, the good guy. Uh, he tries to convince another. So I'm turning off the sound, but still you get the idea here. Um, it's the mental image of this KMT uh, officer. Uh, so this sequence really demonstrated his internal turmoil, his mental turmoil, inner, his inner world. And for the rural audience, such thing could be difficult to comprehend because of its um, modern film language. So here, the film projectionist provided his own narration again. Is there any need for comrade Yang Xiaodong to tell you about all this? Guan Jingtao, you should have a deep understanding of the situation. How many people have been trampled by the iron hooves of the Japanese imperialism? How many families have been torn apart? The Japanese fronted their imperial power before us and shoved their way forward. They killed people and burned the village, doing all kinds of evil. Okay, so, um, so this is just example to show the uh, to to illustrate the film projection is the versatile performance. They mediated the traditional cultural forms and the modern technological spectacle. They guided the audience through film narrative and uh, uh, even elicited their emotional responses. They manipulated the audience attention and most importantly, attuned spectacles to watch films through a political lens. So after this demonstration, the film's director, Yan Jizhou, was quite inspired and he made a comment. He said, oh, watching uh, the projectionist performance made me think about how to create films from the perspective of, of 500 million peasants and how to make films more comprehensible. Uh, so I'm just going to wrap up here. I hope my stories of a film projectionist give you a snippet into the cultural life in the, uh, in the Mouse China. And I also wish to use my story to illustrate the political efficacy is very much contingent upon the individual agency. And the film projectionist, they are maybe a very important little screws on the revolutionary, ma revolutionary machine. Um, yeah, so when we think about the propaganda, it is never a transparent process. Uh, it, is, it always involved mediation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Lu. I think that was an absolutely fascinating uh, lecture. Um, you took us through a whole period of transformation in China. And as you very rightly pointed out, uh, these mobile cinemas were very important uh, for socialist states in particular. Uh, Soviet Union, the agitprop uh, image that you showed us, train image, the agitprop trains, which went across the breadth and length of these huge countries, China and Soviet Union are both very, very large countries, and how they took the message of uh, the revolution to the people far and wide. Um, I think this uh, lecture also exemplified the theme of uh, this conference, uh, which is connected uh, geographies and cultural interfaces, because here you find that these uh, mobile projections are actually creating a kind of parallel geography because they're going all out. They're going to the borders, as you showed. Uh, they're going into so many different uh, geographical spaces, cultural spaces. Ge it's not just geographical, but cultural spaces and how they're actually adapting uh, to each of these new uh, spaces. And, and you know how the performance is a combination of so many different other performances, whether it's the bamboo clap, uh, 
performance or um, so many other things. And um, I'm also uh, completely struck by the fact that uh, both, I, this happened in the Soviet Union too, and in China, this, the scale, the scale at which this occurs, all those numbers you gave us of uh, how many uh, projectionists there were, how they were trained, the long training process of 40 odd days and so on. And of course, the most wonderful part was that of the women projectionists that actually women, and I think this is probably uh, unique uh, to, again, to the socialist uh, states because um, I doubt that in too many other countries uh, in the world, you actually have women going out with so much equipment and that, and that wonderful image you showed of the woman actually standing and putting up the screen, uh, that, that was a really wonderful um, photograph. Um, so I think that, um, uh, you know, you covered so much. And this is a different way of looking at cinema, as you pointed out right in the beginning, not just a textual analysis, but looking at the actual ways in which uh, production distribution is happening and that these projectionists are trained to a level where they are actually film critics and programmers. The double bill uh, was fantastic. And um, so uh, I think this has been a very wonderful uh, window into uh, this other world of film uh, projection that exists because most of us are really in, into the theater projections. And um, I, I was just wondering if this kind of projection um, also existed prior to the revolution? Were there mobile cinemas uh, prior to the revolution? And whether it still continues? Because we do have countries in South, I mean, in uh, Asia where uh, mobile projection still uh, continued till quite till late in the 20th century. So um, those are just two um, minor questions from me. But I think we can start taking uh, the questions from uh, uh, the participants here. Um, would you like me to read them out or? Uh, uh, yes, Anushka, Anushka, do you want me to read them out? Uh, Ma'am, uh, at the moment, uh, we don't have any uh, questions from the audience in the chat box. We do have a comment uh, from Professor Dr. Manoranjan Mohanty, uh, okay. but we could request the audience to either pose their questions in the chat box or raise their virtual hand and then we can just okay. call them. Uh, maybe I can take this opportunity to address Rashmi's question. Uh, indeed, even before the founding of the PRC, uh, there were mobile projectionists in the 1930s, but in the communist revolutionary base areas. And the scale was much smaller. And so that's why in my chart, you will see only in the 1950s, the state had um, a con made a concerted effort to train the projectionist. Then the number increased. Um, so indeed, this practice still continued up to today in China, but uh, its popularity is diminished um, because we do have to think about the social culture circumstances. The reason why mobile projection, uh, projectionists were popular in the, Mao, in the Mao period is because the illiteracy, very high illiteracy. Nowadays, you know, people even uh, with, with popularization of the social media, with the mobile phone, people tend to watch film in different screen. Um, but the Chinese Communist, uh, Ch Chinese Communist Party uh, still wanted to use uh, open door, open air screening the, um, to, to, to publicize, to propagate the polit political messages. For instance, just right after the 20th Party Congress, um, they wanted to show some reports or programs on the open air screenings. But uh, although such practice pers has persisted, continued into today, but they were no longer, they are no longer so popular. Yeah. Are there any questions, any other questions from? Um, Professor, if I may, I have a question for our keynote speaker, if I may. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so my question is with regards to the ideological impact of this kind of a cinema under Mao Zedong's leadership. Um, 
the the concept of say guerrilla militancy or re- religiosity of cultural revolution in this kind of a project uh, of this kind of a traveling projectionist cinema which is going everywhere in the country how do we interpret uh, this this kind of militant or, or um, uh, religious nature religious uh, in the sense that religious towards the ideals of the cultural revolution how do we interpret the impact of uh, the nature of such cinema on the militarization of uh, the chinese domestic population for populace even when there was no war going on even in peace time okay uh, i will try my best <laughs> to to address this question um I think the, uh, even when we talk about the Mao period, uh, it is it can be divided into many sub periods, different sub periods. During the Cultural Revolution, I think those were the most uh, tumultuous uh, periods. Um, there was a lot of um, interruption of a film pro- production and exhibition, so that was quite unusual. So in my presentation, I in fact st- still very much focus on the first 17 years from the 1949 to 1966. Um, the, uh, in terms of the ideological uh, message, um, I think uh, we often tend to overemphasize the political message conveyed by those films. In fact, if we broaden our scope from the textual world to the actual lived experience of Chinese ordinary Chinese people, some people they didn't really care about the political message, right? Uh, the reason the, the, pro, the projectionist had to work out an attractive double bill, illustrate the political message didn't work. People are were attracted to the to the combat scene, to the fighting. And then also many villagers, they went to the open air screening, not because they wanted to get educated, just because they wanted to enjoy the festival, the festival atmosphere, just get together. So there are many, many different factors that are driven uh, that drove those audience to attend the film screenings. So I think um, um, my research uh, is in a way um, responding to the so-called current, the, the new film history studies. We really want to uh, look at the cinema as an embedded social practice. Um, so it is a part of everyday life. Also, as uh, Rashmi mentioned, in film studies, we tend to pay too much attention on the, the enclosed screening space. We normalize, we, we normalize that kind of a basically Western uh, film screening, film exhibition practice. But in fact, you know, in those um, 17 years in, in the PRC, most of people access to the film through the open air screening. It is completely different setting. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I hope I partially answered your question. Um, I Romance see an acceptable crowd puller. That's uh, Professor Patricia Oberoi's question. Was romance an acceptable crowd puller? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, for example, the, the example I used, um, Liang Shanbo and the Zhu Yintai opera film, um, um, it can also be translated as eternal love. It's a romance, right? But the romance is set in an opera, like an old traditional Chinese folk tale. Uh, definitely. But uh, if you look at the film production uh, in that period of time, in the Mao period of time, in the Mao era, there were not so many romantic stories. You can get romantic stories from opera, opera films. Uh, there's another question. Uh, why is there any particular reason you use mobile cinema and not traveling cinema? The term mobile cinema rather than traveling cinema. Okay, uh, so in this presentation, I use these two terms uh, interchangeably. The reason I use mobile cinema uh, is to try to reflect the Chinese term, because Chinese term uh, is 流动电影, 流动, mobility. Uh, it really emphasizes the mobility. Um, I think uh, maybe even the the mobile film projectors, right? The, 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 the portability of the film projectors, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I, 
I have to say, I just use these two terms uh, interchangeably. I think mobility may also may apply to the to the equipment, to the um, uh, uh, to the projector, but the traveling may be less so in a way. Um, Professor Lu, I have a question because, as you mentioned, the Mao, uh, pe um, the period that Mao was, uh, you know, in China, uh, can be divided into several uh, subsections. Um, yes. you, during the Cultural Revolution, it is said that um, cinema was not really made. Uh, on that scale and uh, the film school was closed down. Again, film school is something that's very, uh, that came from the socialist country. The first film school was set up, Geek was set up in uh, the Soviet Union and then uh, China to set it up. And this was closed down. And then when uh, everything reopens after the revolution and you have the fifth generation and they go out and they work, they prefer to work in the peripheries. So Chen Kaige's um, Yellow Earth is made in one of the smaller uh, studios uh, on the periphery. So is uh, Tian Zhuang Zhuang's, uh, uh, his films are made. Uh, so um, did those films too travel like this uh, as mobile cinema in amongst the rural audiences? And did they get, I know that many of them had a lot of uh, problems in terms of being released and so on, but nonetheless, uh, at least at some later point, did they actually also travel like this? Uh, this I don't know exactly, but uh, my guess is no. I don't think so because even when uh, when those fifth generation directors' films was when they when those films were screened in movie theaters in the urban cities, they were not very well received either because the ordinary audience didn't really enjoy them. At the time in the 1980s, people were uh, attracted to Rambo, First Blood, those, those kind of a more <laughs> exciting films. And for them it was like, oh, it's so slow paced, like Yellow Earth, so slow paced. And it's no dramatic plots. They didn't really like it. But I think your question points to the uh, a very interesting um, uh, phenomenon. Like um, that is about the accessibility of a film uh, in different direction uh, for the rural audience. Despite mobile film projectionist, um, they still got exposed to much fewer films compared to the urban audiences. Um, you know, often they have to wait for many years to get access to the newly produced Chinese film. Um, um, and there were definitely quota system uh, in Chinese film production, each state-owned studio during the Mao era were instructed to produce a certain number of a film in certain category. For example, revolutionary war film, you can make 10. And for the agriculture themed film, you can make a five. Um, so the, somehow the, the administered in the cultural um, um, it, Administered, uh, administrators in the Department of Culture, they had this um, strange understanding. They think agriculture themed films would do would do well in the countryside, mm -hmm. but this was not a, this was not a so right. So that's why projectionist has to combine the boring agriculture film with the action film, the war film. Um, yeah. But uh, in a way, I, th I think thanks to those projectionists, the rural audience acquired uh, some film literacy and that, that's very important. Yes. And I also link back to your original comments on the, uh, the cinema of attraction, you know, Tom Gunning's right. article really based on the urbanization that really like saturate the cinema of attraction in this process of modernization, urbanization. But of course here it's different. It's very much rural based. Yeah. Uh, Professor Mitra? Yeah. Um... In the context of your presentation, um, uh, you know, culture had a certain place in the way it was uh, used through the nationalist period and through the period of revolutionary period, if we periodize like that. So, in the context of today's China, uh, where is it going? In terms the culture, of yes. Yeah. In that context, where is cinema going? Yeah. 
Uh, thank you so much for this uh, question. I think the party still plays much emphasis on the cultural production. We see the party always wants to have have this guidance, have uh, has guidance on many cultural matters. In the past few years, we saw the so-called censorship on the effeminate celebrity, effeminate film stars, right? Um, they because still pretty much for the CCP. Culture has a function to reshape citizens, um, but their understanding of a culture is somehow like in a very limited sense, right? They don't understand culture as a practice derived from everyday life. They, they understand the culture like in a very particular sense, continuing Mao's Yang and talks. Um, they uh, currently, I think the party realized the importance of media, different type of media, especially the convergence of the media. So the same message, political message uh, is publicized, communicated in newspaper, but more often, more frequently now is from the social media platform and many different media. So they do, I think they also wanted to upscale, like upscale their publicity um, know-how, but uh, um, it is very difficult to achieve the same um, political goals in a way, because nowadays the audience are more knowledgeable. Um, you know, they are exposed to much more information. Uh, we also see more active, Counterculture activities and on, on the part of the audience, like the audience would interpret certain messages in their own way, right? Uh, in a playful way to subvert the intended political messages. So there's, there's all like the, the culture sphere is always a contested ground. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Ma uh, none at the yes. moment, but I would like to uh, take this opportunity to read out the comment that was posted by uh, Professor uh, Mohanty. Uh, he um, he says um, he compliments uh, Professor Lu on her excellent uh, presentation and says art is mediation, imaginative use of symbols, technology, and objects with purpose should not be dismissed as brass propaganda. I think that's a key takeaway for all of us from this special lecture. Thank you so much for this very kind comments. Uh, Professor Lu, I uh, would like to ask you, um, if uh, during this period that you referred to, um, they also showed older films from the earlier periods, you know, there was the great leftist cinema movement in uh, China from the 30s. And yes. were any of those films also uh, picked up and uh, taken around and shown? Or was it just the new productions made very specifically for uh, this particular audience? Oh, I think the older film, uh, those produced in the 1930s and the 40s, sometimes they serve a different political purpose. Some of the leftist films, um, were labeled as poisonous films mm -hmm. during the Mao era. Yeah, because they, they emphasize too much on the intellectual sentimentality, sent sentimentalism, for example, it's not good enough, right? So those films were, um, uh, were upheld as the negative examples. So mm -hmm. you need to educate the people by showing them the bad examples. <laughs> but uh, as, you, um, as to the, as to like how, uh, audience receive receive them. Uh, I think it's a different matter. Um, yeah. So these were but all the, films actually, made at that time. Yeah, the, those Which film, uh, the early, early film, 1930s, 1940s film, sometimes still were able to meet audiences, but on very different like political <laughs> occasion, like uh, instruction, you know, how, how should we criticize those poisonous films, right? So we need to show you first, then we have a, a struggle session, we criticize it. Um, um, thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, uh, Professor Goyaswamy, can we conclude the session yes. as it's already close to 7 p.m. here? Okay.
Okay. So I think uh, it's been a fascinating uh, one hour. Uh, Professor Lu took us through the 50s. I think we were all in China. Uh, going through the rural countryside, watching uh, the projectionists uh, show their films. Um, this is almost like ethnography, sociology. I think it was an interdisciplinary lecture. It cut across film studies, it cut across cultural studies, uh, and so many disciplines. And um, it also brought uh, the whole era alive for us and uh, showed us how uh, cinema was used. And uh, Professor Lu began with uh, Lenin's statement uh, that cinema is the most important art form. It was in the Soviet Union after the revolution there in 1917. And um, in fact, many of the greats who developed the very language of cinema, Eisenstein, Pudovkin, Vertov, all came from uh, the Soviet Union. And it, the same is the case with uh, China after the revolution where cinema is mobilized. Um, I think the term used is mobilizational states. Uh, these are states that wanted to um, uh, promote and create the socialist society. And as Professor Lu pointed out, it, it was the whole aim was to create the socialist person. So uh, everything was geared towards a particular agenda. And that's not just propaganda. It, uh, it is Professor Lu very uh, lucidly pointed out through her lecture that uh, this was uh, far beyond anything as um, stifling or as uh, constrained and restrained as propaganda. And I think Professor Manoranjan Mohanty also um, pointed that out in his comment that um, the scale at which this transformation through cinema was uh, aimed at and achieved, that so much of training, so much of discourses around the film that the projectionist had to build and he had to analyze and he had to actually explain the film language, you know, what super impo op impositions meant, what editing meant and so on. Um, that, that this pro uh, film projectionist was actually a person who brought film literacy to uh, the population of the countryside or wherever these projections occurred. So um, the kind of uh, scale of not only projections, but also of film literacy that was channelized through these uh, mobile projections. I think um, that was absolutely uh, fascinating in uh, this lecture. Um, I think the intersectional moments of various kinds of cultural activity coming into uh, the projection. So it's not just a film screening as we see in the uh, theater, but it is cultural activity of a larger kind that is happening all around the film. So there's so many things happening around the film uh, that uh, contributes to what uh, would be called the projection of a film. Uh, so I think... Um, uh, this has been a very fascinating lecture and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lu, uh, for bringing your expertise to us, um, to um, this auditorium. And uh, thank you to uh, the organizers of this uh, wonderful event and this conference uh, for inviting us and making us part of it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, with this, we come to a very fruitful ending to the second special lecture and the second day of the 15th AICCS. I express my sincere gratitude to the chair uh, and our keynote speaker for their remarks and for patiently addressing the questions and comments posed by the audience. I also thank the audience for interacting with the speakers and for tuning into the session. Uh, we at ICS have had a robust three-day schedule planned for the 15th AICCS and details of the same are highlighted in the brochure and the program available on the ICS website. Uh, we hope you will also find time to attend our wonderful sessions tomorrow as well, which are set to commence at 10 a.m. IST. So thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you.